Got it? Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks, John. Folks, I think we're going to, uh, if you all find a place, we will get started this afternoon. It's wonderful to see everyone here, and um, especially on such a beautiful day. Um, my name is Larry Reagan, and I am one of the co-directors of the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And I'd like to welcome you to our sixth Coyle Fisher speaker this year. So, so uh, that reminds me that um, as of September 10th, roughish, of uh, 2012, we are now one year old as a center. And um, I'm hoping that, uh, yes, thank you, Herbert. And I paid him $3 to do that. And five if he clapped louder, but that was a good start. Thank you. There you go. You're on. So um, it really is a pleasure to, uh, to be here today and to share with you throughout the day. We have a full day of events going on, and uh, we're really pleased to have our guest speaker I'll, I'll introduce in one moment um, to share with you some ideas about innovation and higher education and change management, very interesting topics. Um, just so you know, by way of format, following Rita's talk this afternoon, uh, and, and we're going to have an opportunity for some questions and answers at the end of uh, Rita's talk, so you can hold on to those, jot them down as you go. Um, following that, we'll have a short break over in the man assembly room, which is just right next door. So we have some, I think, cookies and punch. Right, Patty, is that right? Yes. And, um, and then at 3.45, we'll have the, the coil rig showcase. And this is the opportunity for you to see some of the work of COIL and uh, the kind of research projects that have been generated. And I see lots of faculty and staff in here who are parts of these projects, so it'll be exciting to have them tell their stories. By the way, they get three minutes to do that. But we have a few more minutes for Rita to do that, to, to do her talk. So it's my pleasure to introduce, on behalf of COIL and the Fisher Speaker Series, uh, Rita McGrath. Welcome to Penn State. It's a pleasure to have you here. Rita is a professor at Columbia Business School in New York. And uh, she's one of the, the I would say, forward-thinking uh, innovators in the world of business strategy, change management, um, understanding how to organize and structure um, change forces in our, in our work. And I, I was fortunate enough to be with uh, Rita. She was talking with some earlier groups. And I, I, it doesn't matter whether you're from business or higher education or elementary uh, school. I think this is, this is, these ideas are really good to challenge us thinking about the way we do things and perhaps looking at things a little differently. Uh, Rita's latest book, which is conveniently in my bag, uh, is called The End of the Competitive Advantage. And uh, it's a really a, a great read. Uh, we'll have some copies available for, uh, for later on this, this evening over at the, the Hilton for the program. So uh, one of the titles that we pulled off of Rita's work was the term fast and roughly right. And we thought that was kind of an interesting approach and concept to have in mind as we're moving forward. Uh, oftentimes we're fast and hopefully we're roughly right most of the time. So with that, let me uh, welcome Rita to the podium. Uh, thank you, Rita. And uh, we look forward to your comments and, and we'll moderate discussion afterwards. Okay, thank you. Great. Great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking about one of my favorite topics, which is where are we going in higher education? Um, the title of my book, as Larry mentioned, is called The End of Competitive Advantage. And the book had its roots in just a sense of unease that I had as someone who's a strategist who works with a lot of companies in the areas of strategy. And for years in that field, we've been hunting for something called a sustainable competitive advantage. It just trips off the tongue, doesn't it? Sustainable competitive advantage, which is an awesome thing if you can find one. And here's the problem. Um, in more and more of our economy and in more and more of the organizations that we're affiliated with, that model is actually, in my opinion, causing all the wrong reflexes. It's causing us to rely too much on the past. It causes us to stick too long in one place when the world is becoming increasingly dynamic and, and you know, fast moving. 
And um, so I set myself the job of saying, well, okay, if sustainable competitive advantage isn't what we're doing anymore, what else is there? And there hasn't been a whole lot done on how you think strategically when your competitive advantages last for a relatively short period of time. Uh, and, and hence the term transient advantage and the notion that uh, we need to be prepared for change. We need to be prepared for things to move uh, in ways that perhaps um, you know, are not as comfortable as we might have expected. And I certainly think in education we tend to kind of fall into this. I mean, the basic technology of education has not really changed since the time of Socrates, right? I mean, some guy up in front you know, talking, <laughs> and a bunch of other people sort of listening and interacting, and that's been the core model for a long, long time. So I think it's it's good of us to, to be thinking at this stage about what might we uh, do differently. So I thought, I, to, to sort of bring this to life, I thought a story uh, might sort of set the scene. Uh, the story involves two photography companies, Fuji Film of Japan and Kodak of the United States. A couple of oil and gas billionaires from Houston, and events that unfolded over a period of about 20 years. So Fuji and Kodak in around 1970 were roughly equivalent kinds of firms. They both had great brand names. They both had great technology. They both had their pick of the graduates from the best universities. Really, you know, good, good competitors. Um, and both global, both global operating companies. Um, so in 1973, these guys, the Hunt brothers, who some of us are old enough to remember, uh, decided to try to hedge their positions in oil and gas drilling by literally buying up bars of silver. They were trying to corner the silver market, which, as you know, is a critical raw material input into the whole chemical-based photography business. Uh, they started in 1973. At that time, the price of a bar of silver, an ounce of silver, was approximately 50 cents an ounce. By the time this plot came to light in 1979, uh, the price of silver had gone up to nearly $50 an ounce. But what was even worse was the Hunt brothers reportedly controlled about half the world's supply. This is a pretty scary thing for the photography companies because not only has the price of your raw material suddenly gone way beyond what your business model was built to accommodate, but you might not even be able to get enough of it to keep your factories turning. And they all kind of freaked out a bit. Well, three months later, March of 1980, um, the scheme fell apart. The price of silver dropped precipitously. The Hunt brothers started to scramble. And every photography executive in the world, except for one, said, whoa, thank God that's over, back to business as usual. The one that didn't was a guy named Minoru Onishi, who was fairly new in his role at that time as the CEO of Fuji. And this experience really shook him up. He said, you know, if this happened once, it could happen again. And I really need to be paying more attention to what, you know, kind of what's going on in the world. His resolve crystallized in 1984, four years later, with the introduction by Sony of the very first camera, consumer camera, that did not use chemical-based film. It used a digital uh, memory card. And uh, that Onishi said that was it. At that time, he told a later interviewer, I became completely convinced that film-free photography was not only possible, but highly likely to occur. And what happened over the next period of time was he began to pull resources <laughs> out of chemical-based photography and move it into not only digital photography, but also diversifying the company into other industries. So things like medical equipment, uh, workflow processing, um, energy services. Uh, so he was actually diversifying the company's footprint into other places, even as, as this uh, unfolded. Kodak, what did they do? So Kodak 1990, here's their solution to the digital revolution, right? This is in a New York Times article published in 1990, so 10 years after the collapse of this uh, uh, oil and gas scheme. Uh, Kodak was going to take film, because we can't do without film, you know, film, film will endure, uh, and we're going to put it, we're going to scan it into a digital scanner, then it's going to get manipulated by some kind of computer, then that's going to get into some other machine, which is going to burn it onto a disk, and that's finally going to put it on a compact disk where you can have it. So like six machines based on film, but that's how we're going to do it. Kodak's response, right? So absolutely unwilling to let go of film. I was at a, an IDEO uh, conference last night in New York. Um, they're the founders of IDEO, which is a pretty well-known design firm, have just released a, a new book on creativity. And one of them described going to a Kodak facility you know, around this time 
And uh, he said, it was amazing to me that they were actually substituting nostalgia for strategy. <laughs> no? So Fuji, where are they? Today they employ over 80,000 people. Their revenues last year were $27 billion and change. Uh, they're number 400 on the list of Fortune Top 1,000 companies, and you know they, they're doing pretty well. Kodak is literally blowing up its factories because it can't afford to pay the real estate taxes <coughs> on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the questions I would encourage you to think about are, what's the equivalent for us of that silver thing? You know, the thing that maybe came and, well, we didn't really take it too seriously and it went away. You know, um, what in our profession is, is going to be uh, like that? for us? How do we want to think about that? And the reason I like the Kodak versus Fuji story is because the two companies had so much in common. You know, It wasn't that one was clearly superior to the other in terms of brand or technology or people. It really came down to leadership. And so I think it's an interesting way to think about how would you run your organization differently if you genuinely thought your core business was not going to be so relevant in 10 or 15 or 20 years. What, would you, what decisions would you be making now that would uh, reflect that change? And so that's really the idea behind the end of competitive advantage, which is how do you think strategically and differently if you already recognize that the world is changing? So take, for example, a very common perception in strategy that the most important competitors we have are within our own industry. When I started in strategy years ago, the, uh, the, the, cool, the cool kids were doing things like industry analyses, right? And you'd look at things like market share matrices and how, how much were you investing in R&D relative to your industry peers and what was your, all that stuff, right? All industry-based stuff. Well, today, the most significant competitor any of us face may not even be from our industry. It might be from some other industry coming in, swooping in, and making what we do irrelevant or taking away some of the resources that we need. So here's a data point for you. Um, in uh, uh, last year, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal did an analysis of household spending, oops, this is going to get in the way, of household spending by uh, consumers, and uh, he was comparing household spending from 2007 when the iPhone was first introduced to um, 2000. I'm getting myself all balled up here. Hold on, I want. I just don't want it to clunk against the. Uh... Okay, wait a minute. We'll do this. <laughs> um, it compared household spending from 2007 when the iPhone was first introduced to spending uh, from 2007 to 2012. And he looked at a various number of different categories and what did he find? Spending, household spending on telecommunications was up by 11 to 12 percent. Spending on apparel, down. Restaurants, down. Travel, down. Automotive, down. So if you're sitting there and you're running a, a restaurant, right, and you're benchmarking yourself very diligently against all the other people running restaurants, you're going to lose the plot completely, right? Because the issue is not, you know, am I, am I better than the guy down the street? The issue is, am I doing something compelling enough to get the average household to spend more with me than on, on you know, talking on the phone? I had another example of this just recently as I was giving a book tour. Um, I was uh, approached by a guy who runs a string of candy shops, candy shops. And he said it used to be that he could pretty much count on, say, a Friday when the, the kids got their allowance money, their pocket money, that they would come in and spend it on candy. He said, today, what are they spending it on? Cell phone minutes. Isn't that interesting? So, uh, you know, this sort of themes of inter-industry competition, I think, are pretty, pretty important to think about. Um, okay. So I think um, we need to be considering what I call a new playbook for strategy. And these are some of the pillars that I think the companies that I studied that seem to get this uh, are uh, following. It's, it's, it's like you can think of it almost as a new playbook, right? So the first one is what I call continuous reconfiguration. And I came upon this in a kind of an unusual way. It was a surprise to me, this finding. Um, I had done a big study looking at every publicly traded business organization with a market capitalization of more than a billion dollars as of the end of 2009. And there were 5,700, no, 4,792 of them, just FYI. Uh, so nearly 5,000 firms. And asked a simple question, how many of them were able to turn in steady performance year in, year out, um, even though the markets are volatile and things are changing, uh, over a fairly long period of time, over 10 years? Um, and I found exactly 10 companies, 10 companies out of nearly 5,000 that were able to grow their net income every year by 5% or more each year. 
And I thought that was an interesting measure. Now notice I'm not measuring total shareholder returns. There are lots of other ways you could measure performance. But what I was interested in was what are they doing that allows them to be so consistently performing over a long period of time? And um, I thought, I'm going to learn a lot about how companies manage transitions. So I put my graduate students on the job. I tortured them for an entire summer. I said, I want to see the downsizings. I want to see the reconfigurations. I want to see when they reorganize. And they looked, and they looked, and they looked. And they came back after an entire summer, and they said, there's not anything there. And I said, how can that be? These were times of such tumult, and you know, these firms were. And what, it, what I found, and it really surprised me, and it drove me crazy, because I was expecting to learn all these cool things about how, how does an organization that's a steady performer manage disappointment and downsizing. And then I said, maybe there's something to this. What they seem to do is continually adjust their structures, their budgets, their funding, their uh, activities a lot on an ongoing basis. So by the time you get 10 years out, there are very different organizations than they were when they started. But you don't see big, wrenching, major changes. What you see is a lot of fairly steady, incremental uh, change. So at Infosys, for example, which is one of the 10 companies, they budget their company every quarter. Think about that. Every quarter. And they rebase the budget every quarter. So if you're in part of the organization that's growing and deserves more resources, they can very flexibly move the resources into that part of the organization. Conversely, if you're in a part of the organization where the business really isn't justifying the investment that you're making, they can start to extract resources out of it. So over time, you, know, you have a real adjustment. And that's this notion of continuous reconfiguration. Now, I don't know about your esteemed institution. My esteemed institution has a departmental structure that has been the same probably since King's College was founded in 1754. <laughs> you know, uh, very, very much silos and very much the same structures and, and so forth. And I think that could be a real impediment to our ability to take you know, our institutions where we want to take them in the, in the future. So reconfiguration is, is one. The next thing that I observed in these firms was something I call healthy disengagement. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you think of the life cycle of a competitive advantage, right? there's a period of time at which you conceive it, and it gets tested and built up, and you prototype, and eventually you bring it to scale, and you ramp it up. Then there's this lovely period of exploitation, which is terrific. You know, you've got something in place. You're making money. The competition hasn't caught up with you yet. But you know, over time, in an open market, as long as there are no entry barriers, competitors will imitate. Customers, clients, uh, students in our case, uh, you know, they get bored with whatever you're offering and they want to know what the next thing is. And so that advantage comes under pressure. Now, sometimes you can think of a way of renewing it, or sometimes there's an entry barrier which allows you to hang on to it, but sometimes it's going to go away. You know, it's landline telephony, right, or dial up internet or something. Oh, here's a factoid for you. Did you know that 3% of American internet users still use dial up? I was stunned to find that out. 3%. That's pretty interesting. Amer America Online makes $500 million a year on dial-up internet. Who knew? Um, but to all intents and purposes, dial-up internet is definitely not a growth <laughs> business, right? Um, so we need to get better at disengaging, pulling resources out of something that's exhausted so that we can use those to fund innovation, to fund the next generation competitive advantage. Because what we really ideally want is a pipeline of advantages. You want things to be um, continually refreshing and renewing as old things kind of fall away. But disengagement's really hard. So I go to large organizations and I say, you know, tell me about your capital budgeting process. And they'll lay it all out, right? Or I'll say, tell me about your supply chain. And they'll give me a picture. Um, if I say, tell me about your disengagement process, I get back these blank looks. They're like, huh? <laughs> Many organizations absolutely have no, they don't even think about what do we do when we have to stop investing in something? How do we pull resources out of something? So I think that's something we're going to have to get better at, that, that whole life cycle of competitive advantage. Um, that goes together with what I call deft resource allocation. Um, and I used this example earlier. So imagine to yourself, you're Mr. Sony Walkman, right? And you own the Walkman franchise. Um, and what are you great at? Well, you're great at getting maximum power out of double A batteries and the little gizmos that go and taking content off of discs or tapes or something and, and playing it with enormous fidelity back again, right? And that's what you're great at. And someone comes along to you and says, guess what? In five years, no more double A batteries, solid state power. 
No more albums. It's all songs. And the songs are going to come to us through the air. And, uh, and you know, no more little worrying gizmos. It's all going to be digital and solid state. And your natural reaction is to say, oh, OK, well, if that's the future, let's take all this resource I'm putting into R&D to support my existing business and put it into this new thing. Typically not. So one of the things we look for is, is the resource allocation process tied to the power structure? Or are there people in the organization that are capable of looking at the whole portfolio and saying, wait a minute, this one you know, is, 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 is beginning to fade. We need to start putting resources into something that's newer. Um, the stock markets for publicly traded firms often take great issue with this. So this happened to Verizon when Ivan Seidenberg came into the company. And he looked around his portfolio and he said, my god, you know, physical phone books are probably not a growth business. <laughs> and he proceeded to sell them off to a private equity firm that, va that valued the steady cash flow. So uh, physical phone books in the United States, $9 billion business. Even today, isn't that bizarre? And I, that, that, I thought that was amazing. But anyway, the, the analysts went crazy. They said, oh my god, how are you getting rid of these beautiful, stable, you know, quarter in, quarter out cash generating businesses to put your money into weird stuff like Fios and LTE networks and you know, all these other services that you're trying to develop getting into broadcasting? Well, he's since been proven absolutely right. Phone books you know, are continuing to follow a slow decline. And Verizon is now squarely positioned to take advantage of a lot of the new services. Uh, they're able to avoid being turned into dumb pipes because they control so much of the user experience. And uh, it's been an actually pretty fortuitous move for them. Uh, but at the time, it was hard. So deft resource allocation, being able to get resources out of places where they uh, shouldn't be and into places where they should. Then we have the problem of innovation. So remember I said innovation is going to need to be something we all get better at because that's where the new pipeline of new advantages comes from. And yet in most organizations, innovation is kind of episodic. You know, the CEO or some senior leader says, damn it, we need more innovation around here. You, 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 go form a skunk works, you know, and <laughs> go off and think great thoughts and come to work in painter pants or something. Uh, and this goes on for two, three years, you know, until the senior guy gets distracted by something else or there's a financial problem somewhere else in the organization and the little innovation group kind of gets broken up and things settle back down to normal until someone else says we need more innovation around here and the thing repeats itself. So I would argue in a company, an organization that's capable of sort of surfing these waves of competitive advantage, more and more we're going to see innovation almost like an, a robust industrial process. Not episodic, not under the wing of one or two people, you know, not something that happens just because, oh, it's Thursday, it must be innovation day. It's going to be much more systematic. So I'll be very interested to have a look at what, what you guys are working on uh, in, in, in the innovation space going forward. Um, I think leadership, as I pointed out with, with the Fuji versus um, Kodak example is going to be absolutely critical because if the leaders aren't willing to get ahead of these changes and make some of the tough decisions, uh, nobody else in the organization is either. And a big part of what leadership is going to require, I think, is being able to be very candid about bad news when things don't go as expected, when things don't unfold the way that you were hoping, and be able to get that data out on the table to get it out there fast you know, to make sure that we can work on it. Um, Alan Mulally was a, a, the, a former a senior leader at Boeing, and he was recruited to join Ford in 2006. And at the time, Ford was on track uh, to lose something like $6 billion. I mean, they were, <laughs> they were in very, very bad shape. Uh, and Mulally um, said, OK, you know, was persuaded by the Ford family to come and try to turn Ford around. So he shows up day one at work into the executive parking garage, looks around. There are no Ford cars in the executive parking garage at Ford. <laughs> Not a good sign, right? Um, so then uh, he's a very famous for his metrics. He's a very metrics-driven manager. And he likes to have his management reports all color-coded. So green is, you know, way to go. Yellow is, hmm, some issues. Red is like, whoa, stop. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. So he comes into the, <laughs> into the first meeting with his executive team. They've all got their reports on the table in front of them. And it's all green. All green. And Mullally says, how can we be on track to lose $6 billion and you're telling me it's all green? Come on, guys. You can't manage a secret. We've got to get this difficult to hear information out there. Because if we can't see it, we can't fix it. 
And, um, and finally, after two or three such meetings, this one guy, who's now actually on track to be the heir apparent to Mullally, he gets up and he says, all right, all right, I'm red on the, let's say it was the Escalade or something. Um, I'm red on this project. And the whole room goes really quiet. And they're all kind of looking at him going, well, Mike, it's been swell knowing you. you know? <laughs> because the culture in the company up to that point was, you know, you kept your bad news to yourself. You didn't let it get out there. You, you tried to protect your position. Uh, Mullally gets up and applauds. And uh, he said to me, I had the pleasure of interviewing him about this, and he said to me afterwards, that was such a breakthrough. He said, it was great. We could start talking about it. He said, it was also kind of terrifying, because the next meeting we go to, it's like a rainbow in there. It's just you know all kinds of badness. <laughs> but they were able to fix the company. They were able to turn it around. And in 2008, when the automobile company heads famously went to Washington to looking for a bailout, Mullally went along, but not because his company needed it, but because he was worried about his supply chain. So uh, this n pressure on leaders to get the information out, to be unflinching in the face of news that we might otherwise not want to see, I think is a big deal. And I don't know what your institutions are like, but I know mine, there's an awful lot of people in my school that are saying things like, we've been here since 1754, you know, our business model has been very robust, we are, after all, Columbia University, we really don't need to change. And you know, any bad news just gets met with this absolute wall of denial. Uh, when we all know things are, are likely to change and likely to change in ways that we don't necessarily expect. Lastly, and I think this is really important for educators, is we're starting to see evidence of a real change in how people have their careers unfolding. And I mean, this has been going on for a while, but I think it's accelerating now. That increasingly, we're not going to see career ladders. You know, it's not going to be you join, you know, crown cork and seal at the age of 24 and work your way up from a level 17 to a level 2 or whatever it is. Increasingly, jobs are going to be a series of uh, gigs. You know, people call them tours of duty, right? So what you're doing is you're actually building skills and capability across a variety of uh, assignments that you might have. Uh, I was uh, talking with a friend of mine who works for a consulting firm about you know, people in their 20s and how do they think about their careers. And he told me a really interesting story. He said there's this young consultant that works for his firm and they had given her an assignment to do like a market sizing, let's say it was. Um, and he knew from experience it was probably going to take her about two months. She comes back in a week and it's done. And he's astonished. He says, how did you do that? <laughs> and she said, oh, well, you know, I called up my friend Mike, and he's really good at statistics, and I called my other friend, and she's great at market sizing, and I called this other person. She had built in that week a virtual team of about 10 people, all of whom piled on in the evenings when their own days were done to help her with her project. Now, here's, I mean, I think that's just amazing, because some of those kids worked for competing firms, too. I mean, it wasn't like they were all part of her firm. But here's why I think this is so interesting. That network she's building is probably going to be more of a security net for her than the company she's working for. You know, that group of people are people she can carry with her in, in, in her life. And I think people like that just look at networks differently. They look at what being employed means. I mean, employee loyalty is gone, you know. Uh, and so I think it has big implications for how we help people prepare to create uh, careers like that. So that's kind of the broad brush uh, look at the, um, at the, the, the contents of the book. But I think if we, we think about what we're here to accomplish as universities, right? increasingly we're going from a world where we had systems and stable career paths and hierarchies and teams, and job hunting was something you engaged in you know, now and again, but not constant. Uh, and careers were managed more or less by the organization. What we're seeing now is an emerging picture of a world in which not all jobs, I mean, please, God, not nuclear engineers or you know, <laughs> people flying airplanes or something, but, but a lot of jobs that used to be fairly steady uh, jobs are individual skills, a series of gigs, individuals rather than teams, uh, permanent career campaigns. And you know, we talk all the time about you have to manage your own career. Well, people really do now. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's the head of uh, talent management for Pearson, big, uh, big um, you know, publisher, you probably know Pearson. Um, and she was recounting the story of one of her acquaintances at the firm who was let go and said, I never thought this would happen to me. And she'd been interviewing for new, new jobs. 
And she said, what these employers are looking for are skills I just don't have. They're looking for social media awareness. They're looking for my ability to relate to technology. They're looking at digital competencies. And my friend was beside herself. She said, you know, for years, I have offered free training, you know, online and in person and in course form on all of those subjects. And the woman just didn't take advantage of it. I couldn't get people to go. They didn't think it was part of their day jobs. So now here's this woman, uh, unemployed, and uh, it's going to be very hard for her to find a place without significantly upgrading some of those skills. Because in today's world of textbooks and publishing, if you don't know anything about technology or you're not able to demonstrate that you can at least make smart decisions about technology, you're going to be at a real disadvantage. So I think part of our challenge as educators is you know, how do we think about what we're going to do to help people navigate this? Because this is complicated stuff. And, uh, and, and there's not a rule book for, for it yet. So um, in, in the book, I have this uh, set of questions that, that I pose to individuals. So the, the last chapter in the book is really about individuals and how they can or not manage in this um, kind of transient advantage world. Um, and you know, if my current employer let me go, it would be easy to find a similar role. If I lost my job, I'm well prepared. I know what I would do. I've worked in some meaningful capacity with at least five different organizations. I've learned a meaningful new skill that I didn't have. I've attended a course or training program. I could name 10 people who'd be good leads. I actively engage with networks. I have enough resources to buffer me. I can make income from a variety of activities, not just my salary. And I'm able to relocate or travel to find new opportunities. And my argument is the fewer of these things that you can say yes to, the more at risk people's careers kind of are. Um, any reactions to that? Comments? Questions? So some good questions to think about. Oh, yeah. Um, it seems we still tend to review resumes. It seems we still tend to review resumes. With the, the fact that like, hmm, this person is doing this and why this person they done it more frequently yeah. than we had liked. So the question yeah. was, um, we, we, renew, we review uh, resumes uh, with this mindset of, you know, can't this person hold a job, for God's sake? Um, and I think actually that's, that's a legacy from a kind of a baby boomer time, I, I think. That, um, and in fact, I was talking to a banker about this on my book tour. And he said, you've made me think about these young people's careers in a really different way. He said, because I had that exact bias. It's like, what do you mean you only were there 18 months? You know, I mean, 18 months to somebody who's 23 today is an eternity. They see that as a very long thing. So I think we're going to need to think a little bit differently about what signals a quality person? And you know, some of your real talents may not want to work for one organization. They may want to have jobs for different organizations. It may be a different way of structuring their careers. Um, and, and I mean, I think it's interesting when you put the lens on it of, oh, well, I want to build deep skill at one organization. I'm not sure you want to do that anymore. So it's an interesting dilemma, I think. Back here. About, um, I think about how we invest. We invest in a multiplicity of, of streams, and yet most of us think of having a job mm -hmm. uh, in terms of one income stream. Are you aware of universities who are actively educating their faculty and staff to um, obtain income from a variety of activities? Um, well, we do it a lot de facto in the business schools. Um, you know, be, the, you, you work in executive education or you work in, um, um, you know, training and working with executives. And it, that's very likely to throw off consulting business and, and other things. I don't know of anybody that's doing it as a formal process um, where we're saying, okay, we're going to teach you to do this. I do think that would be something that would be very attractive to a lot of people. You know, how, do you, how do you manage the brand of you? How do you manage the, the, the one of you? And then how do you run a business that way? There's a woman I'm... I have this dangling conversation with, uh, who wrote a very interesting book called Formerly Corporate. And the book is aimed at all those people who are sort of refugees from the corporate landscape who are now thinking they're going to go be consultants or whatever, but have no idea how to go about it. Don't have the right reflexes, aren't used to doing without the support network, all that, all that kind of stuff. So good, some things to think about. So let me um, just bring this back now to a little bit of what we're all about here in education. And I would argue, you know, we're well past the early warning stage. I mean, well past it. I mean, look at this list, right? Non-traditional competition, we're seeing it right, left, and center. Corporate universities, online training, 
bite-sized skill development, ask an expert, I mean, you name it. There's plenty of other players that are trying to you know, consume some of the resources we've offered. Lack of affordability, you know, every one of us gets criticized for that. Uh, dissatisfaction with results, you know, increasing pressure to say, okay, when my kid is done with four years with you, what is their life going to be like? Are they going to have a good life? Are they going to have access to decent jobs? Or is this going to be just a theoretical kind of thing? Pricing pressure, fewer traditional students. I did some work once with the SunGuard Higher Education, and they had produced some very interesting data showing that if you look at the, the sort of student population, the minority of them are what we often think of, which is a traditional four-year start at one place and end at that same place kind of student, that much more moving around, taking a break, mixing offerings from different institutions. Um, you know, it's much less clear what the pathway is to an educational environment. Um, this is really important. Fewer, lower level, intelligent jobs. So, you know, reading legal documents to find a key word. Well, no person needs to do that anymore. A computer can do that. Scanning medical records, you know, doing medical coding and billing. Um, you know, jobs that used to require some form of intelligence and human intervention, but are now being automated or digitized or offshored. So a lot of those good jobs that used to be in that kind of uh, sort of pink, white collar world uh, have, have uh, gone away. Uh, time, time famine. <laughs> you know, there's not a person in the planet who couldn't use two days for every day they're given. Uh, so where do we insert education in a world which is starved for time, right? Rejection of traditional teaching techniques. You know, you here, I don't need to tell you guys about this, but you know, the traditional thing where the professor gets up in the middle of the class and spouts off received wisdom and the students diligently take notes and then re reproduce whatever they learned on some kind of exam. I, you know, our students aren't putting up with that anymore, or they're not putting up with it happily. Um, and that really changes our model. For example, we're building a building at Columbia and my, many of my esteemed senior faculty are insisting on tiered classrooms. Tiered classrooms with a professor at the center of the universe. I think that's crazy. What I think we should be building is very flexible space. And if you want tiers, you build them. You know? And if, if you don't need tiers, you don't have them. But I think we're going to really see some big, big differences. Um, for US schools, the rise of very credible non-US schools has been a big, big trend. Um, it's certainly in business school, we're seeing that. I mean, it used to be pretty much with a couple of exceptions. You had to come to the US if you wanted to get a first level business experience. Uh, that's not true anymore. And uh, we've made it so difficult for international people to come here that, that a lot of times they're like, it's not worth the hassle. You know, I can get nearly as good an experience staying closer to home. Lots of substitutes. Degree ratcheting. This is one we don't talk about enough, I think. Years ago, a high school diploma actually meant something. Today, I was, I was doing some research on this today, receptionists, you know, medical assistants, dental you know, office workers, they all say BA required. I mean, it used to be a high school degree was good enough for those jobs. Now what you're hearing is everybody has to have a bachelor's. So what you're seeing is this kind of ratcheting up of the formal requirements for jobs that I don't actually think really require that level of degree. And I think that's a problem, you know, too, because it becomes much more expensive for people to get access to jobs that may not even be there. And then finally, employers requiring higher skill levels. And what that means is uh, if those simpler intelligence jobs go away, what gets left over are quite complex jobs. I mean, to, to work in a factory today, you might need to know calculus. You might need to know, you know complex machine interactions. You may need to know um, a lot more than you did at one point to sort of screw this thing into that thing, right? Um, and I think that puts different pressures on how we prepare people and what, what we do. Um, Everybody's talking about MOOCs. You know, I, I, I think MOOCs are an important thing. I think there's a lot we can learn from them. But I think they're very at a very early and primitive stage. I don't think we have any idea where MOOCs are going to go. The analogy I like to use is of the early days of the movies. In the early days of motion pictures, nobody knew what a movie was. Right? They didn't understand the technology. And so what did they do? They staged plays with actual actors up on stages. And they filmed the plays. And those were the early movies. And I kind of think MOOCs are there today. You know, so it, what are they basically doing? Not all of the better ones, but a lot of them. You're filming a guy talking, right? And maybe there's a discussion section and so forth. But it's trying to take this experience, this in-class, in-person experience, and sort of replicate it in some way. My guess is down the road, we're going to see what we currently call online education evolve in really, really interesting new ways. And we're going to take advantage of what those technologies can really offer us. 
uh, and it's going to be quite different. So I don't. I think MOOCs are something interesting. I think they're worth talking about. They're certainly demonstrating you can do some things at scale in a way we've never thought about before. But there's no business model. We don't really understand the pedagogy. We don't really know why some people succeed with them and others don't. We don't even know if completing the course is an appropriate measure of quality. I mean, we, there's a lot to be learned in the rigorous, but I think we're going to get to. So are there opportunities? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's some really interesting new opportunities uh, opening up. Um, the first one being, I think that the rise of online and other forms of education uh, are simply going to make many, many more people part of our addressable market. And you're seeing that with MOOCs already. You know? I mean, one MOOC, get 80,000 people all over the world to subscribe. People who, for reasons of geography or funding or finance, could never hope to take a course from a you know, degree-granting institution like this before. So the market is going to be uh, bigger. Back to this comment of multiple revenue streams, I think we're going to see more of that, right? So you know, maybe, maybe your professors get taught you know, in-person teaching hours is so much of your dollars, and then some of it comes from a, a MOOC. And if it's popular enough, you, know, you get uh, recurring revenue every time you run it. Maybe there's a software component. So I think there's going to be some really interesting new models that get to uh, emerge. So uh, Berlitz is an interesting parallel industry to ours. Um, I, I had the, uh, the head of, uh, well, at the time he was in Brazil. Now he's head of the Americas for Berlitz in my class. And they were a tired, tired brand. I mean, Berlitz was so hard to do business with. I, I wanted to take German classes with my daughter one summer. And before we could even sign up for a class, we had to go into their offices during working hours and get sold by some you know, sales rep. Uh, and then it was so many courses, and you had to have such. I mean, it was really inflexible, very difficult. Um, and so Marcos Justos, who's the, my, my colleague, um, came in, and he said, why do we do it this way? And he went through their book of inquiries, and he found that in a typical year, they had 2,400 requests for Arabic lessons, none of which they were able to address given their existing model. And so they innovated a thing they're coming to call Berlitz Connect. And it basically says if you can get seven or eight people who are prepared to at least be on a virtual space at the same time zone, we can put together a class for you. And it's like a telepresence, so it's a very rich environment. It's the same kind of teaching that you would get in, a, in an in-person class, but it's distributed now. So if there's only two people who want to learn Arabic in a given city, that's no longer a barrier. So it's an example of how they're able to actually address entirely new kinds of demand by rethinking how they're, how they're doing business. Um, something we talked about this morning is a big problem I see for organizations of many kinds, but business organizations is where I see it most keenly, is there used to be a lot of companies that had sort of middle management ranks, and there were trainer jobs, right? So you started off as somebody's assistant, and you worked your way up, and eventually you became a regional president, and then you, know, you worked your way up, and you became a vice president. Well, a lot of those jobs have been delayered. And so as people are moving through their you know, much less stable careers, they're being asked to make much bigger career jumps. Um, and I think there's going to be some real opportunity in helping organizations think through how do I prepare people who uh, need to get good at management faster? You know, how do I, instead of a five-year rotational assignment, can I do it in three? You know, instead of, of just on-the-job learning, can I also infuse that maybe with coaching and feedback and behavior? And I don't know what else. But, but I certainly see that as an example of a class of problem where education could play a role in finding a solution. Um, Another big thing I'm seeing with companies, so this, uh, this uh, picture is a guy named uh, Chris Kopalakrishnan. He's the former CEO of uh, Infosys and one of its founders. And I asked him, I said, well, so tell me what you guys do about the pro now, Infosys is a big, um, well, they started off as an outsourcer, then they do consulting, and they do a lot of kind of technology work with their clients. And I said to him, you know, technology changes all the time. What do you do with people whose skills are no longer at the cutting edge when you need them to be for your clients? He said, we hire for learnability. And we invest in people's ability to learn new skills. We don't hire for skills. We hire for learnability. Now, an interesting thing I think we have as a challenge is how do we help our students develop learnability? How do we help them? develop that part of themselves. So they're not just sort of ticking off a box and saying, yes, I learned calculus. It's, I learned calculus. I learned I can learn things. Now I want to go learn Portuguese, You know, whatever it is. We hire for learnability. So I think there's some really interesting and provocative roles education can play uh, there. This is another interesting example to me. Um, 
This is a partnership between the government of uh, Illinois, no, no, I'm sorry, Georgia, the Caterpillar Corporation, and the local community college. And what Caterpillar has, has bemoaned is it's very difficult for them to find people in their local communities with the right kinds of skills to immediately go to work in their factories. They're finding they really have a long lead time. So what they've done is they've partnered with this state government and uh, local community colleges. They've donated the um, equipment. So this is all Caterpillar-owned equipment. The community college people do the teaching. The State Department of Economic Development pays for a lot of the programming. And these guys are working in an actual simulated Caterpillar plant as part of their training. And those that get through the course, it's a very rigorous course, but those that get through the course are pretty much promised a job with the company. So what we're seeing now is these really interesting blended models of what education means to employers sort of emerging. Uh, and it raises some fascinating questions, right? I mean, this is not a classic liberal arts, let's discuss Dante for two hours kind of class, right? Uh, it's very much closer to, to getting these people into some kind of decent employment. Another interesting example I ran across the other day is a chemical company in the South that actually has built a game, a simulation game, out of their plant, mocking up their plant. And so people can come and play the game for free. They come to a physical space, and they can pull the knobs and levers, and, and they get scores, right? They compete against each other. Uh, and the ones that get a high enough score on the game um, get an interview at the company. Not a guaranteed job, but they get a shot. Uh, now, why I think that's so interesting is all the company's done is provided that as a resource. The students self-select. They, the ones that have the stick to itiveness and the commitment to really learn that game are likely to be the ones that are better employees anyway. So I think, I think there's some really interesting gamification, kind of how do we blend the virtual and the real world's things in some really interesting things. Um, now that much being said, the delivery vehicles and the business models likely to be very different. And that's where I think universities will struggle because <laughs> we've got very traditional business models. Um, so the first uh, model, I'm sure you're all familiar with Salman Khan and the Khan Academy. Yes? Yeah. So this whole notion of flipped pedagogy. So you know the elementary school kids go home at night and they're told to you know do do exercise ten point two, observe Khan teaching it. Then we're going to come in the next day and you're going to do work uh, with the teacher helping you through where you get stuck. So the teaching is not here me I have the content anymore and then you go home and do homework at home. It's look at Khan he's got the content now I'm going to help you master it. I'm going to help you really apply it. And I think flipped pedagogy is going to play a much bigger role, especially as we start to look at what I'll call the, 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 the more regional players, you know, the ones without huge brand names or, or, or you know, five-star uh, uh, draws in terms of that, because that's where real application can happen, and that's where that adds real, real value. Then um, I think we're going to see a real change in how learning is delivered, so things like on-demand pedagogy, so learn it as you need it. You know, here's some modules as you're going through your day. Oops, I need to learn something. I learned another really interesting example of this. Uh, the other day I was, I was interviewing an entrepreneur for my, my next book, and he was telling me at, about a website called clarity.fm. And the way this works is it's a broker, and if you're an entrepreneur with an interesting experience or background, you can sign up to be one of their experts. You put your availability on the website, so they've got a calendar function. And the buyer, somebody who's uh, interested in talking to you, signs up for a piece of your time. You tell the website what your minute rate is. So let's say you charge $5 a minute or something. At the appointed time, this person calls you up, and they can ask you whatever question you know, comes to their minds. They can have a 10-minute call, half an hour call, whatever they've signed up for. Clarity then pays the entrepreneur his, minute, his or her minute rate. The person's credit card is charged to ask the question. And now what you've got is a connection to real-time, just-in-time learning, where both parties are interacting around a real problem that somebody's going to go put to work right away. Isn't that interesting? You know? Contrast that to, well, yeah, I studied, uh, studied that in my junior year, and by the time I really need it, you know, three years later, it's you know, gone from my head. So I think we're going to see a lot more effort to bring learning closer to the point of use. And whether that's on demand, whether that's something like this. Uh, and, you know, I think it has the, the potential to really influence um, retention, to really influence what people keep. As I mentioned, games. This is a picture of that chemical company I was telling you about. It's, it's, a, ver it's a game. You know, it's an actual game which simulates the factory. 
Uh, and I think gamification is something you're just starting to see um, in the early, early stages. And as usual, it starts kind of at the low end. And it can be something as simple as the McDonald's employees who get told you want to charge somebody for a hamburger, you push the hamburger button. <laughs> and they train them on that using a game. Uh, Two much more sophisticated things like this. Um, and then you, know, you ask yourself, well, are we prepared to think like game designers? You know, how, how do we know what makes a game engaging? Do we know what makes someone want to persist in finishing the game? So where are the opportunities? Um, I think we're going to see new forms of demand, relaxation of con traditional constraints. right? So distance is going to be less of an obstacle. Uh, price is probably going to be less of an obstacle. Uh, we're going to see new needs that start to emerge. So one that I'm very interested in is a thing called virtual mentoring. Uh, and some companies are uh, using this with their younger employees. So here's the concept. Uh, millennials are famous for wanting feedback, right? And But with, with you know thin, thinly populated managerial ranks, there's just only so much feedback you can give people. So what this one company is exploring is a thing they call virtual mentoring. And the way it works is this young person gets a mentor. They don't know who the mentor is, but they have a private sort of space, like a, like a chat room, where they can exchange ideas. And so the young person can ask questions. Oh, I've got a big presentation coming up next week. What would your advice need to be about X, Y, Z? Or they can pose a question. The mentor can give feedback. And it's virtual. They don't know who each other are. So kind of interesting. And it gets the young person the feedback they're hungry for you know, without tying up huge amounts of executives' time, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, continuous learning. I'm very intrigued by this one. Right? I mean, whose idea was it that everything you need to learn comes in one package of time? Right? Instead, what if you broke that off over a longer period of time and you learned on an ongoing basis as, as you needed to, as you wanted to? Um, and new kinds of partnerships. You know, I think we're certainly here at Penn State, you're exploring very innovative partnerships. I think educational institutions are going to start to do a lot more of that. So you know, maybe we're partnering with government, with business, with other global institutions, lots of different things. And I think the business models, right? Traditional but more tailored, the flipped, the whole idea of on demand. Games, interactive simulations, you know, the possible business models have just really exploded for, uh, for what we can do. So I think there's going to be some really interesting developments in that regard. Um, so sometimes at the end of a talk, you know, people will say to me, oh my god, you know, this future you're talking about is really scary and all the rules are being rewritten and, you know, my god, what are we going to do? Um, and, you know, so I'd like to finish on, uh, is there good news in this? Yes, absolutely. You know, Think of the richness of people's lives who could never hope to approach the quality of a Penn State education because they're in Azerbaijan or something. Um, and we might be able to actually touch them. It could make a big, big difference. Um, I think we're not there yet, but I think in the future, it could be possible for people to get off of a career track, you know, keep their skills fresh through online, through networking, through whatever, and then come back in again at the next wave when their skills are in demand. I think it'll be a lot more like making a movie or putting on the Olympics, um, you know, where you kind of are, you have a project and you bring together the people whose skills are relevant to that project. And when the project is done, you know, they kind of go on to other things. And I mean, wouldn't that be cool if you didn't have this sort of incredible tension between tending to what you need to attend to in your personal life and being able to also have a fulfilling and rewarding career of some kind? Uh, if it wasn't like up or out, you know, if it wasn't the sort of a coming or going. I also think there's going to be a lot more opportunity for entrepreneurship. Uh, if big companies can't lock you out and keep you out of your advantage anymore, then there's going to be lots of opportunities for smaller ones to come in and to do interesting things. So I'm not an advocate for a world of transient advantage. I should probably make that clear. But I do think it is upon us. And, and there's no point being in denial about it. Instead, I think what we really should do is say, OK, if that is what we're facing, what are the kinds of things we can do now? And I think there are many. I think there are many. So I'd like to leave the formal parts of my remarks with, with, a, with a bit of a note of optimism. It could be very exciting. And, uh, and I think what we're going to hear later today is, has that kind of flavor to it. OK, so questions, discussion. First off, uh, Rita, thank you so much oh, for poof, that uh, <laughs> stimulating talk. Oh, thank you. Scary, scary, but stimulating. Thank you. So um, here's how we need to do this. You have to have a mic when you ask a question so that we can get recorded for the, uh, for the recording for the media site people. So just put your hand up, and uh, Brad and I will, will get over to you. So can I start off? This is the sure. advantage of actually holding the mic. I can start yeah, off yeah. with one. So, go for it, so I want to go way back to your very, very first few statements that talked about the Fiji film example mm -hmm. 
and um, in higher education. And I'm wondering, what is higher education from your perspective? What is higher education's film? What higher is the thing? Film? Yes. In person. That's what in I was person, person, thinking person. you were going to say. Um, and again, we I know plenty of people who still take pictures with film-based cameras, and, and it's just not the mass market anymore. So when you think of the total addressable market for higher education, the rate-limiting step is I, I'm one person in a room talking to a room full of people, and, and that doesn't really scale. So I think, I think it's still going to be there. It's still going to be really important. Please don't think I'm saying this is all going to vanish. But I think as a proportion of the total set of activities dedicated to something you could call higher education, it's going to represent a smaller share. So as you think about that and, and you think about the higher education institutions you've interacted with, mm -hmm. what, what's a typical, could we predict the typical kind of responses? Oh, oh they my. freak out. Yeah. They freak out completely, yeah. yeah. I got, I got to pulled to, um, well, so I should put this in context. So I'm, I'm doing a session like this for 450 business school deans from the AACSB out in San Antonio. And one of them says, you've got to come talk to my university. And she's the dean of Northeastern Illinois University, which is sort of in a suburb of Chicago. Um, and we got to talking about their role in their community and what they do. And, and it's very clear that they're already suffering from the model that's eroding. And I said, well, look, why don't you think about yourselves not as serving 18 to 22-year-olds, but why don't you think about yourself as a focal point for those families that those 18 to 22-year-olds are in? How would that change your model? And it was electrifying. We had a whole group like this to do some brainstorming. And I mean, I'm not saying that's what they should do, but the opening up the possibility to maybe our unit of business, if you want to think about it, is not an 18-year-old. Maybe our unit of business is the family that that 18-year-old's in. And, and they were coming up with ideas like, oh, we could have our entrepreneurship students start a daycare center. We could have uh, the mom come in for courses in how to you know, build a skill at uh, selling her knitted goods. We could have, you know, and we just, it opened up a whole raft of additional things they could do that would be good for the community, good for the families, good for the schools, and possibly revenue generating. So I think part of our challenge is, is, is how do we frame what we're doing um, in, a, in a way that, that is perhaps a little bolder than we've traditionally thought of? You know, God did not come down and say our target market's 18 to 22-year-olds. I mean, that, you know, that's not like a force of nature. I mean, it's, it's, it's convenient to have them out of the house for those years. I will admit that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, 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 but there's a lots of other ways we could, we could make an impact and, and make a difference. Okay, yes, good. Go Kyle? Okay. Thanks, Brad. So I thought you might say the degree was our silver. And one of the things I want to wonder about with you or have you uh, think about is you talked about the sort of the just enough, just in time, mm -hmm. you know, learning at the moment kind of thing. Have you heard of the concept of digital badges mm -hmm. and sort of badging and sure. creating, you know, seeing our product? So you, you talked about redefining our market, our customer, <coughs> but also we might want to rethink our products and say we don't just sell these monstrous <coughs> degrees and these, you know, also very large courses, but we have a new product line, which is these smaller units of learning. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I, in fact, I've said for years, and this is one of the things I said to the AACSB deans, um, I said, once you have certification at the level of the skill or the course or a badge or, you know, whatever it is, um, the pressure to get a degree goes away. And the analogy I would use is it's, it's a lot like the music business, right? <laughs> what do you, you used to have to buy 14 songs to get the one that you really wanted, right? Well, in many ways, we do that to our students, right? Here at Columbia, I'll pick on my own institution. We force them to take our core because every living Columbia alumnus has taken that core. Uh, and, you know, that's probably four courses these students would really, in many cases, prefer not to be bothered with. But to get that degree, you are forced to take our core. And so I wonder a little bit if we're going to be disintermediated the same way that the albums were by, by the certification. But it's not just albums. We're forcing to buy the boxed set. Of, uh, <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> And, um, you know, certainly for certain easy-to-measure skills, you know, coding or, or certain kinds of technical proficiency, you know, you can actually test for mastery of those skills very easily. I think it gets harder as you're testing for things like critical reasoning or, you know, persuasion ability or negotiation skills. But, you know, it, there are smart people working on those problems, and I, my guess is we'll start to see some headway in, in being able to assess how good people are at developing those things. Well, and, and with the uh, the badging and the transparency that it brings, even if there is no right way to teach critical thinking or leadership or whatever, at least we'll be able to see 
the different approaches and weigh them against each other and people will have the kind of be able to make the informed choices that we make now when we buy other things yeah. uh, in an electronic yeah. world. I think it could be really very neat. Right? Besides, I mean, you know, between us, what professor comes into campus and says, yes, today I am going to teach 300 people the required XYZ 101 course, and that's how I'm going to spend my semester. Woohoo! Nobody likes teaching required courses, right? The students don't like being there. The professors don't like having to prep for them. Nobody likes doing the grading. So it's kind of a situation that just cries out for some kind of entrepreneurial solution, uh, in my experience. And I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a little hyperbolic, I'm sorry. But you know, if you think about the hardest courses to teach, uh, you know, they're the ones we tend to give to our junior faculty. They tend to be the ones that are least appreciated by, by the students. And they're really, really hard. I mean, it's a hard task to have to do that. So why wouldn't you outsource some of that? You know, let the guy at Tuck, who is the world's greatest accounting professor, do intro to accounting, which is exactly, by the way, what Harvard's doing. They said, we, we don't need to be bothering our faculty teaching basic accounting. You take it the summer before you come for your MBA, and you take it online from this guy from Tuck. It's not part of our curriculum anymore. So I don't think that's such a bad solution. Oh, yes. You'd, you'd, need a, you'd need a mic there. Sorry. We have dueling microphones here. <laughs> I'm glad you're running around this time. <laughs> Not me. I really resonated with your comment about MOOCs and about, and I think we're measuring it in all the wrong way. And I guess I want to tie it back into just in time learning because I went into a MOOC, a financial MOOC, just to get a piece of information. I didn't need to go through the whole MOOC. And it, for me, it was just in time. I was working on a project, I needed that information, and you know, and then I left. So is that, was that a successful experience or not? I, I think it was. But I think a lot of the, the institutions that are panicking are, again, taking that same model yep. and, and, and putting it on the MOOCs. Yep. And I think we just have to think creatively about that. So I appreciate I that. Yeah, yeah, good. Great observation. Herbert had a question back here. OK. You're going to get your exercise today, Larry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rita. Um, thanks for rocking our boat. <laughs> Uh, In the most positive possible way, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was uh, very intrigued when you early on in, in your talk uh, mentioned the benchmarking uh, conundrum. When we benchmark against uh, similar institutions, we may miss the, the real threat out there. Um, could you speak a little bit about what's on your radar on in terms of threats uh, for, higher for higher education, you know, and beyond online, we, we are pretty comfortable right now on that, and we are just, you know, getting into MOOCs, we kind of understand mm -hmm. that, but beyond that, is there anything out there we should pay attention to? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think um, you can think about competition, right, for product, product service markets or for factor markets, so your inputs, your key inputs. Um, I think one of the big challenges higher ed faces is a lack of legitimacy on the part of people that provide the resources that keeps this whole engine going. Um, meaning, if we are not perceived as delivering value, being relevant, you know, being a place where people can go in order to get ahead or whatever it is they need to build a good network to have a good life, um, a lot more people are going to make the decision that it's not worth it. Um, and and I think that's that's a sort of a over the horizon kind of kind of judgment, but. You know, if, if we start to, right now, I would say, there's pretty much consensus across the country that getting a college education is a really good thing, and getting a master's is probably even a better thing, you know, that it's, it's a door to a prosperous life. Um, I'm seeing that confidence eroding, uh, and I think that's a huge, it's not an education issue, but I think it's a legitimacy issue. If you look at industries that have lost their legitimacy, and I'll pick on the most obvious one, which is smoking, right? Uh, I mean, it used to be, if you go back and look at those old management screeds from the 50s, um, you know, there were ashtrays in every, in every um, um, meeting room. There were, you know, there were, it was perfectly normal to, to come into the office and smoke. I mean, I was in a, a, a place, a restaurant the other day um, in Florida, as it happened, and there were people smoking in the restaurant, and I was shocked because in New York, you can't do that, <laughs> right? You're out on the street, snow or rain or hail. So, it's an industry as a whole that lost its right, you know, to to be regarded as normal and legitimate. And I think those are the kinds of almost existential threats we need to be thinking about. Which is, you know, once higher education loses its 
primacy in the mind's eye of people. You know, there's going to be less demand. I think pragmatically and a little bit closer, a little bit less existentially, I do think we're going to start seeing enormous pushback on the part of people that provide the money. Um, you know, many, many, many students' households uh, are just completely overextended with student debt. Mm -hmm. They're not seeing the payback on it. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see legislative and other pushback on the, so the reasons that debt was allowed to balloon so high. So I think there's some really um, kind of factor market issues which uh, I, I take seriously. In terms of um, uh, other, 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 op, uh, what did I say? Other um, kind of things I would have on my radar screen, um, I would certainly be looking at how other countries are tackling the problem of, of getting people the skills they need in the way that they need them, uh, which may not be anything to do with formal education. You know, it could be, it could be programs like uh, in Finland, they now have Alto University, which is actually combining engineering, design, liberal arts in this sort of uber structure where they're trying to really make much more, in other words, they're leaving behind the disciplines. They're trying to sort of get phenomenon driven education into people's minds. And they're doing it by actual practice. Or another one, which isn't really education, but it's, it's an exemplar of a kind of solution. Um, you know, if you look at something like cataract surgery here in the United States, it's, it's a whole process, right? You, get, you have to be diagnosed, then you get measured, then you have the surgery, then you have follow-up, then you have thing. And the actual surgery itself, the economics are driven by the economics of the surgical suite. And in the surgical suite, which is an expensive room, you have one patient, you have a doctor, an anesthesiologist, a surgeon, a nurse, you know, and it's all driven by that. Well, in uh, India, this social ventures uh, organization said, well, cataracts are a big, big, big problem because when a person goes blind from having cataracts, which happens as they get older, not only do they suffer, but they become a drag on their entire family. And that can become a drag on the entire village. But these are desperately poor people. You know, we couldn't possibly have that whole Western thing. So what they did was they said, let's rethink what having cataract surgery is. So the way it works is a, a, a van goes around to these villages and does the diagnosis. Diagnosis. So they know now what the populations are that need this surgery. Uh, they go around and do the prep work and the measuring and all that. On the day of the surgery, big truck pulls up with all the equipment necessary to set up essentially a field hospital. The beds are all lined up in a row. You know, the patients lie down on each bed, and each of the specialists goes from bed to bed to bed to bed doing their bit. So the anesthesiologist, the nurse, the surgeon, you know, the whatever. And by the time they've gotten down to the end of the beds, the person has gotten up, and it's a whole new cast of characters, and they go back to the beginning and start over again. Um, fraction of the cost of the Western procedure. Now, when I talk about this to audiences in the West, I kind of get this, ew, you know, that sounds kind of creepy reaction. The quality of those procedures is every bit as good as the Western procedure. It turns out Henry Ford was right. You know, when you do this 500 times a day, you get very, very good at it. So I'd say we want to be thinking about analogies of that to how we would rethink education. You know, how would we just completely change the rate limiting steps that keep it the way it is? Um, and I'd be looking in those kinds of spaces for what, you know, beyond MOOCs, what's, what's the next big thing? Because if you could get a cataract fixed, without having to do all that. If you could get a person to the right place without having to invest in all this bricks and mortar infrastructure, you know, maybe it's Google Glass <laughs> you know, that says the answer to that equation is X, Y, Z. You don't need to think about it. You know, I don't know. Um, but there'll be things like that. Over here, yeah. Uh, in the corporate world, the, the metric, the main metric for success is, is increasing profits. In education, I presume that the metric for success is improved learning which is a lot harder to measure than mm -hmm. profits. So do we, we get into a situation where we're either slowing innovation down so that we take the time to measure the learning or we keep moving at, this, at the corporate pace but we're pushing out innovations that we're not really sure of and they might actually be doing some harm. Mm -hmm. So what's some strategies from your point of view for doing innovation, particularly in education, the right way? For doing innovation? Uh, we were actually talking about this this morning. I think you need to make a distinction between what you might consider to be your core sets of activities. So, you know, things you're doing today for people who give populations you've already identified where you know what the outcome is, and what I would call your investments in options, which are typically either experiments or small investments or sort of windows on an opportunity. And they're really different things. Um, the watchword with an option is you want it to be relatively low risk, you want it to give you a convincing result, 
You want to contain the downside. And you want to structure it so that you can learn from it. And so a lot of things in life, you need to build a prototype, or you need to try it, or you need to get out there and see how it works in your life before you can actually draw any conclusions whatsoever. I think where organizations go wrong is they try to do everything the same way. So any program we do has to have you know, a program manager and two co assistant coordinating program managers and a program office. And, you know, totally unsuitable for something that's brand new. Something that's brand new, you want to experiment and prototype and trial it first before you make a big investment. So that's one way I can do it. To come back to the metrics thing, you know, I find this fascinating because when I talk to people at universities, they often say that. Well, we can't really measure the outcome of what we do. And yet, isn't the entire principle upon which our grade-based system of granting degrees depends premised on the idea that we as professors can measure whether our students have achieved a level of competency at what we were trying to teach them? I just find that an absolutely fascinating uh, kind, of, kind of disconnect. Um, because, because the theory behind degree granting is we as the doctorate or whatever have said, yes, you, know, you, you deserve to graduate. By definition, that's a value judgment, right? So I, I find it kind of interesting that we, 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 we sort of, on the one hand, in our classrooms, we say, yes, yes, we can measure competency. And then when we look at ourselves in institutions, we struggle much more. Um, I do think metrics is important. And I'm not sure, I do worry about, you know, you can't boil everything down to people's employability. I think, I think that misses some of what our mission's really about. Um, so I worry that we go too far in that direction then. What was this proposal last week or the week before that every college should have a, a re return on, what did, I, I was in Europe and missed it, but somebody was telling me about it, that there's this proposal that every school should have some kind of report card looking at the cost of the school relative to the jobs their students got afterwards. Well, you know, I went to Barnard College. It's an all-women school, and an awful lot of people in that school are passionate about the arts, they're ballerinas, they're um, the debaters. They're very few people there are the same people that I teach at the Columbia Business School. Well, obviously, you're going to have differences that have nothing to do with the intrinsic nature of the education that they got. So I, I really worry when we go too far over on that. Now, at the same time, I was saying this this morning, I think we as a community get a little self-indulgent sometimes, you know? The history of the American situation comedy in sociological terms. Really, you know? Maybe that is worthwhile, maybe it's not. But, but you know, there's some things that I think are just a little too self-indulgent about, about how we structure our offers. So I think we need to be careful about that. Sarita, I, I happen to know we have a couple students in our, uh, in our audience today. Ah. And uh, I've, I've seeded one with a thought. Oh. And, and that is, I'd love to hear from some of our students about their, sure. from where they sit, how this uh, perspective resonates. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm going to ask Paul Well to start us off here. Great. Um, in reference to your description about how there's a massive movement going on in MOOCs, and how a lot of skills in the industry focus on specific skill sets rather than a variety. Um, what I really see as a student myself, and you've seen at Columbia, that people don't really want to focus on a broad variety of topics rather than focus in on specific industries within their major. Do you see that being an advantage while doing studies? Um, well, it, there's a bit of nuance to it. I think, go, go back to Chris Gopalakrishnan and the principle of learnability. I think you don't want to so narrow yourself down that you, you know, you, you, your, your degree is only relevant to a very tiny proportion of things. So I think you need to preserve learnability. At the same time, focus isn't a bad thing. Um, you know, and, and mastery of something rather than a smattering of things across a lot of broad things I think is valuable. You know, one of the things I do really appreciate about the American system, though, when I compare it to, say, the system in the UK or other parts of Europe, I mean, I have uh, nieces and nephews who are coming up in the UK system, and they have to declare at the age of 18 what they want to be, whether it's medical or whether it's a lawyer or whether it's whatever. And to me, what I love about the American system is you really can try a number of different things because how do you know what your passion is at the age of 18, right? I mean, so, so I like the idea of having some variety and then, and then, and then honing in on developing real mastery at something. Also, um, in your reference to the cataract disease and how they handle mm -hmm. that over in the third world countries, um, with having MOOCs, what vehicles do you see improving the way MOOCs are being done? You said that it's a very early stage mm -hmm. we're in. What types of vehicles do you see or technologies that would improve the experience? Uh, of, of taking a MOOC? Yeah. I think, I, um, I think, well, I think the first thing I would observe is I think we'll start to see MOOCs go from being these monolithic, you know, 10, 12, 16-week things to being much more bite-sized and indexed and 
you know, if all I really want to learn about is what's the appropriate way to structure a cash flow statement, you know, that's the only thing I need to take. Uh, and we'll probably price accordingly. You know, it'll be much more like Lego brick pricing, right? Um, I also think we'll start to see MOOCs um, use more game type solutions. And then what we're already seeing happening is MOOCs are being blended with in-person exchanges, whether that's meeting at a Starbucks or forming a study team or whatever. And we're starting to see more reintroduction of the personal experience um, into the MOOC. So I think those are some things we'll start to see. You know, we're, we're already starting to see some of them, but, but I think we'll see, see more of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, you talked earlier about gamification. Uh -huh. um, I was, I've seen a lot of gamification in classes taking on, online. Mm -hmm. How do you think people can bring, or teachers can bring ed, uh, gamification into a classroom? Into a classroom? Yeah. Well, we do it a lot already with simulations. Um, you know, early versions, simulations, role plays, um, you know, competitive uh, 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 exchanges, um, formal computer simulations. Some people use those very effectively. So I think we're starting to see some of it there. Um, I could also see you having problem sets that are worked out the way a game is worked out. I could see apps, you know, so this app will lead you through. In fact, I'm, I'm wanting to develop an app myself for this executive course that I run where it would actually sort of ask you questions about what issue you're facing and then point you to the right kind of tools or solutions. Uh, which is a game type um, interactive sort of thing. So we're starting to see early signs of that. And as a follow-up, uh, how do you feel about instead of a grading system based on you know, letter grades, uh -huh. a grading system based on experience points experience. where you start at zero and build up? Interesting. I, I mean, it's an interesting idea. Um, I personally never liked the letter grade system. Um, at Columbia, we have this particularly horrible thing we do to our junior faculty, which is we allow electives to be graded any way you want, and we force um, our faculty to grade the, the core courses on a curve. So not only do the students not want to be there, but you know a third of them are going to get the lowest grade. And our, of course, our students come in believing that they, you know, they're all type A, edgy New York types. So you know they're all masters of the universe, and you, you know a third of them are now going to be the, the bottom half of the class, so bottom third of the class. So it's it's very very difficult. So um, you'd have to be careful about in any measurement. Um, slightly parallel thought, any measure de erodes over time in its ability to predict an outcome. So if you were to draw a distribution of, say, baseball batting averages from 1926, you'd get a normal distribution. If you do the same distribution 1986, 60 years later, the average would be the same, but the range would have narrowed a lot. Why? Because pitchers learn to pitch better. Batters learn to bat better, and the ones that aren't good on that particular grading scheme drop out of the population. And so, what happens over time is any measure is uh, vulnerable to gaming. And so, you'd need to be—I don't mean it in the pleasant gamification sense; I mean it in the manipulative sense. Uh, so, what you need to be careful of is, is how you design and construct those measures of experience so that they're not manipulated. Um, but I kind of like the idea. I mean, I think it would be an interesting, different, you know, take on a. Because it's been statistically shown that grades in school are only very weakly correlated with subsequent performance in other areas of endeavor. So uh, you know, being a really good student doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a great business person or an entrepreneur or, or whatever. Uh, so you know, maybe experience points would be a different way to go. Thanks. It'd be cool if you had the choice, wouldn't it? I mean, one of my colleagues at Wharton who teaches in the Entrepreneurship Center is always really frustrated, he said, because the admissions committees systematically weed out the students who he thinks would be perfect for his program because they're not team players and you know they were off inventing things in test tubes when the other guys were you know feeding starving babies in Somalia or whatever it is. And he says, you know, we systematically weed those out of our system. It's very frustrating by the way we sort of structure our admissions decisions. Back there. Sir. Hi. Hi. I'm wondering, uh, with regard to episodic learning, are you worried that people might become over-specialized? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We see, it, we see it in the academic disciplines, right? I mean, right now, to get a PhD in one of our programs, you have to be so deep and narrow. You know? I mean, the, at Columbia, we say it explicitly. You have to be the world's leading expert on X. And by definition, to be the world's leading repository of knowledge on X, you've got to make X pretty narrow. Uh, so I do worry about that, and I worry about us being able to have conversations across across those silos. Um, strategy, which is my field, by definition is an interdisciplinary field. It pulls from marketing, and it pulls from pricing, and it pulls from people understanding, and it pulls from you know a lot of other things. And so it, it finds a very difficult time finding a home in places where you know you can pigeonhole people very neatly. So I do worry about excessive specialization. 
And you know, the thing about excessive specialization also is it limits your adaptability, right? Because if you've got a range of possible outcomes you need to respond to, and you're just able to deal with this, and something happens over here, it leaves you um, at a disadvantage. I think we have time for one more. One more, okay. Be the, um, the last one, but oh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> maybe the good one. Okay, I'll try. And as, and as a graduate student, so uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, when you were talking about the, this, the um, journey, like the career journey, the duty path. Uh, mm -hmm. How you can tours of duty. The tour of duty. Yes, uh, need to cite it correctly. So, uh, I, it reminded me of the new psychological contract. Uh, in contrast of the old uh, psychological con uh, contract, and as we know that it, the old uh, psychological contract in the businesses came uh, supported uh, and was supported by legislature and came with a series of laws. So as we move to kind of what you're presenting uh, for the new psychological contract, any uh, uh, feedback on this or discussions from the government when it opens or before it <laughs> opened. So on this on level of yeah. uh, legislature uh -huh. behind this new contract. Right. Any ideas or thoughts? Well, this, this is actually one of the things I'm most worried about with the whole notion of a transient advantage economy because what I think we've lost is, is the buffers and a lot of the protections that used to allow, you know, people not to have to bear the full brunt of all this uncertainty and change and, and all this stuff. Um, and what we're starting to see now is people with rare, valuable skills that companies value, that are able to do this learnability thing and continue to develop themselves, they're doing really, really well, better than ever. And people without that, you know, for whatever reason, you know, maybe they just got unlucky in the family selection process or they had to go do something else, look after aging, whatever. Uh, people who weren't able to build those capabilities are really, really hurting. And so I think one of our great unfinished question marks a as a society is, is how do we make sure that individuals are to some extent buffered from having to bear the full brunt of this. Um, Thomas Friedman of the New York Times had a great phrase for it. He says, we're all going into a 401k world now where all the risk, you know, pension risk, health risk, you know, whatever, uh, where people are now having to bear all that risk themselves. And, and I think that's worrisome. I think that's worrisome. Because the danger is that we'll have uh, an acceleration of the haves and haves not problem, and that's already really bad. So what are we going to put in place to kind of counteract that a bit? And I don't, I, I wish I had a solution. I really don't. Um, I mean, as an individual, if I were advising, advising individuals, I say, look, build, you know, go back to that list, right, that you've got here. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, work on that stuff. You know, make sure that you've got alternatives, make sure you've got buffers, invest in what you, you can, you know, take the initiative to, to, to build valuable skills. Um, but it's really hard, and it's, it's uh, on an individual basis. People are much more individually responsible for it now. So as educators, think about what you're going to tell your students about lists like this one. Because you know? it's, not, it's not like you're going to go to Penn State, you're going to go to the career fair, you're going to get a job offer from, I don't know, local employer, and you're off to the races. It's much more tortured now, much more um, twisty. So that's one I really am worried about. I think, I think we're perhaps needing a new social contract, and I don't quite know what that's going to look like. So thank you for your question. It's very thought-provoking. Good, and thank you, Rita, again. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Rita. Thank you.